Legend of Total War here, and today we're doing another Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires campaign review, this time covering Yuan Bo. Now, when this DLC came out, I didn't expect this campaign here to be the one that I found most enjoyable, but it actually turned out to be the case, because I thought that the Changeling was going to be the campaign for me. But this one here is right up my alley, because you have the option in this campaign here to either have a relatively chill sort of normal campaign, or a more ambitious, challenging campaign, which is the one I like to go for. But you get to make that choice at the early stages of the campaign, depending on what you want to do in it. So Yuanbo starts off in Northern Lustria at the Isle of the Crimson Skull, which is a new settlement in Immortal Empires based on the latest patch. And you also have this settlement over here, Floating Pyramid, which is just a ruin. I don't recommend building anything here to begin with because these guys will just come and snatch it off you. You also start off with territory in Cathay at Shangwu, which is technically your capital. Now in the early stages of the campaign, similar to what happens with Malice Darkblade, you have the option to sell Shangwu for 20 grand over to the Western provinces, and then just sort of nope out of Cathay. And this will allow you to have, well, dedicate all of your resources with a big amount of money uh, to start off um, into Lustria. And that's an easier campaign to do. But if you're like me and you wanna have a more ambitious campaign, you want everything for yourself, uh, you reject that offer and recruit an army from here and advance onto the Jiangxi rebels and try to actually take control of Lustria and uh, not Lustria, Cathay. Oh, Lustria and Cathay at the same time. There's no option for you to just abandon Lustria. You need to do that for your campaign objectives up here, which we'll get into in a minute. So this is more challenging to do because even though you're gaining more assets out here, you're increasing your supply lines. And in the early stages of the campaign, these settlements are not really going to provide you with adequate amount of, of uh, resources in order to have a split empire. So it's quite a challenge in the early stages of the campaign. Also, this is where you're going to be sending your caravans from. So you, it is good to, to stay here. But it's entirely up to you which way you want to go about that. I really enjoyed the ambitious side of that campaign because it's challenging, but you've got the tools that you need to to uh, do a good job if you understand them well. And that's what I like about this campaign or in these sort of campaigns in general. So you've got sort of two main campaign objectives here. You've got the Wujing Compass ones. And this one I didn't find particularly interesting, but what you need to do is capture four specific settlements. So the Great Total Isle, Hexawadle, the Southern Sentinels and the Star Tower, you need to build those settlements up to tier three and build a specific landmark there. And it'll activate a sort of ritual of rebirth similar to what the, um, or pretty much identical to what the Wood Elves do with the ritual of rebirth in their tree settlements are, where you've got a certain amount of time before it finishes and it'll create three locations which you can intercept the armies that are going to spawn there or just wait for them to show up and then uh, defend the settlement after they spawn. And then once it's done, it activates a, uh, another element here on the Wujing Compass, because previously, uh, prior to this patch, there was only four um, locations on the Wujing Compass, but now there are eight. I don't find that the bonuses that these ones provide are very interesting, and since you can only have one uh, active at, at any given time on the uh, Compass, I just am not really incentivized at all to do this <laughs> whatsoever, so I find that this bit here fell completely flat. Uh, but the other part, the steel and stone mechanic of the, um, the statecraft, this, however, is worth investing into. And the great thing about it is that you don't need to go out of your way to activate this stuff. It'll just, you will get these tokens just by playing the game. You don't need to do anything extra apart from just spending them. So the way it works, it was a little bit confusing at first, uh, but you start off with four tokens. You have two steel and two stone, so you have a balance between them. In order to get more tokens, you have to spend tokens. So if I was to spend two stone tokens, let's say I use Crackdown here, they would turn into two pending steel tokens. Now a pending token is one that is going to eventually become available, but it takes five uh, ticks in order to become available. It says here, one of each pending token will be available in five turns. Winning a battle will decrease this by one turn. So what it simply means is that if you fight a battle, then you only need to wait four turns. Or you could just fight five battles in a single turn and then you'll get a token. So the more battles you fight, the more often you'll get these pending tokens back. Now, if you've got a pending steel and a pending stone token at the same time, one battle will reduce the tick on both of them. So it depends on how you want to go about that. So basically having a balance between that is definitely incentivized. Now, 
in order to get more tokens, you have to create districts. So you need to basically set up an unbalance. You need to have either four stone tokens or four steel tokens. And then you designate a tier three provincial capital that is owned by a Cathayan faction, preferably yours since you want to get the benefits, but you can do it on any other Cathay faction if they've got a tier three settlement before you. And this one here, the Fortress City, this is good for doing into settlements that doesn't have tradable resources. So for example, Isle of the Crimson Skull here doesn't have a tradable resource. Every single tradable resource in a um, commercial district, which it's only going to apply if it's in the major settlement, not in any of the minor settlements, has a global bonus attached to it. But yeah, if, if they don't have one, designating it a Fortress City is, is, in my opinion, better because this one will give you bonuses, global bonuses to your armies. Whereas this one will give you global bonuses to your economy, depending on which way you want to go about it. If you want to just go all commercial districts everywhere, you can totally do that. But one of the specific benefits you get from a fortress city is a global bonuses, uh, global bonus by 10% to ammunition faction wide. So that's definitely a very powerful mechanic since uh, a lot of their best units are missile units. And then once you've created a district of either type, it will create a new avail, a new pending token for you to have. So. At first you'll have five, then six, and seven, then eight. Eight is the maximum. And then that'll unlock essentially all of the other um, all the other state crafts here. And some of them get pretty damn powerful. And this one down here, when you're balanced between four and four, this one will give you access to four different uh, global bonuses, pretty significant, which you can choose one of them. And that remains permanently active until you do it again and then switch it if you want to do that. But overall, I found this mechanic very similar to Eshin's shadowy dealing, which is not a problem because I like that mechanic. And um, it gives you a lot of incentives to just keep using this throughout the entire campaign. There's there's no downside to using it. It doesn't cost money or anything because you're going to fight battles. You're going to go through turns. So this is just going to constantly tick up. You don't need to go out of your way from the, the Total War experience to do this, which is one of my main complaints with the Realm of Chaos campaign is that you're constantly taken out of the Total War experience to go and do something that ultimately leads to a very unfulfilling result. Whereas this, uh, you just play the game and you will be able to do these, which is what I enjoy. It is it is quite overpowered though, which that's pretty typical to uh, of, um, of DLC factions. So overall, I would recommend this campaign to everyone, regardless of what difficulty you're playing on. Uh, regardless of whether you want to play an ambitious campaign or a chill campaign, if you enjoy playing as Cathay at least somewhat, I would highly recommend giving Yuan Bo a go. Of course, assuming that you have even bought the DLC. And of course, if you don't want to buy the DLC, that is entirely respectable uh, because obviously it is quite expensive. Wait for a sale if you can. Um, otherwise, if you've already got it, I would recommend giving this one a go. Yuan Bo himself is also a very powerful character. I think one of the things I enjoy most about him is his ability to snipe enemy characters. He's so good at it. Just about any character in the game, you use the Emperor's Executioner to get their health down really quick, and then when their health down is down beyond a certain threshold, just get him in to use any ability on them and he'll just insta kill them it's really good for finishing off characters so n you're not going to have with him a situation where oh man the enemy lord how many times has grimgore gotten away from me with like 10 health remaining well that just isn't going to happen with yuan bo going up against him so i quite enjoy uh, yuan bo's ability to decisively get rid of characters that you don't want to deal with anymore so he's really good at that anyway that's the end of this one here guys let me know in the comments below what you think of yuan bo's campaign i personally really enjoyed it and i Highly recommend it, of course, if you've got the DLC. Anyway, that's the end of this one. Appreciate you guys, and we'll see you next time.